welcome and thanks for coming. Um, we are going to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, the University of California, we have started um, working on a multi-phase digital preservation um, suite of activities in order to facilitate and understand um, the needs of a system like ours for digital preservation. Um, and while this is phase one of a multi-phased um, <clears throat> series, I thought it was kind of important to just come to a meeting like this and let folks know that we are doing what we're doing. Uh, the University of California is a pretty large space. We have lots of different types of campuses and as a result, um, many different kinds of um, data that needs to be preserved. Um, so I'm gonna talk for a few minutes about um, sort of how we got to where we are and then um, Mary and Edson are going to talk about our process. Um, and this is, sorry, this is, I'm putting my administrator hat on. I often get questions about uh, how we sort of govern the University of California libraries. Um, and there's really um, a couple of uh, groups that are important to this discussion. Uh, across the university, we have a, a group called, um, uh, we have this organization called UCLASS, which is the governance structure. Uh, at top of that organization is this thing called the Council of University Librarians, or we, as we call them, COOL. And um, supporting COOL is a, another group um, uh, called DOC, the Direction and Oversight Committee. And uh, I sit on DOC. Uh, DOC is a group of um, high-level administrators uh, reporting to the university librarians, and our job is really to um, take um, projects, plans, goals from uh, COOL and, and make those things happen. <clears throat> and COOL states these plans and priorities annually. Um, and one of those goals um, stated is uh, to maximize the long-term access to digital content. And it's been a priority for the University of California library system for a, about a decade. Uh, we've done lots of work um, in lots of many ways prior to this. Um, about different aspects of uh, uh, digital content access. Um, and now we're getting, uh, we're trying to get quite serious about digital preservation. Um, and just, I wanted to mention here that during the discussion at DOC about the working group and how we might um, best position the working group to do the work, um, we made an emphasis to recognize the importance of marrying, informa marrying information technology uh, and with library <laughs> preservation activities. So you'll see the working group uh, at the end, and there are uh, IT professionals working alongside um, the library. Um, and we uh, put this working group together with a charge um, to do really a few things. Uh, investigate internally. Um, what are we doing as a system right now with regards to uh, digital preservation? Uh, we wanted to develop a baseline to measure against, so we used OAIS as a baseline uh, to develop sort of a high-level overview, to find out where our gaps were between what we were doing and what we should be doing. And then we took a look externally, so we uh, looked at a lot of external digital preservation providers, uh, and we did a series of interviews with them, um, asking them a bunch of questions, and that's sort of the genesis of our report. And um, you know, yeah, so this is really the, the meat and potatoes of the report. This is the work that um, uh, people did. Um, the idea with the phase one report was just to get a, really a steady state about what it looks like in the system, what people were using, what activities they had, um, sort of what, what, um, what they didn't have. Um, and I'll talk a little bit at the end about sort of um, what we discovered as well, Mary and, and Edson talk, as they talk through the process. Um, and as I think um, uh, we found lots of preservation style activity, um, but not necessarily um, structured and organized in a way that um, uh, we felt the system uh, will ultimately need to um, uh, be and do in order to do this content. So with that set up, um, let's start talking about phase one focus. So 
So as Todd um, laid out, we were um, going to focus on, on a couple of tasks as a working group. Sorry, I don't want to trip over this. Um, first, we're, again, looking outward. We're going to talk to external uh, digital preservation service providers. We're going to then look inward, talking to the UCs, talking to our, our fellows and colleagues about the activities, either both current or planned uh, down in the future. Um, then we're going to look across the various, uh, the, those two groups and see where we had um, some overlap, uh, where we had gaps, uh, try to come up with some best practices, um, and, and look at what are the areas we needed to develop. And then ultimately, the goal was to develop a, a phase two charge um, that we would, we would pass on to the next group. And um, so we were really the starting point. We were sort of laying the groundwork that we would then build on in subsequent groups. So our timeline was, was fairly aggressive. We um, kicked off in October 2018, and we were to deliver our report in April 2019. So we had about six months, which um, given the scope and, and everything was um, a bit aggressive, but we stuck to our guns and um, wanted to be fairly targeted. We held um, weekly meetings. We gathered data. We um, then analyzed our data, and then we wrote our report collaboratively online together. Um, in terms of, you know, and Ed, Edson was our chair, so he kept us on task, which was great. Uh, and we shared uh, data through a wiki and also a Slack channel. So the scope was defined for us to be uh, digital assets that were owned or created by the University of California. So digitized content, born digital content, um, research data, publication data sets, and scholarly output. So um, our methodology, we, we considered doing a survey. Uh, we thought that might be one way to gather the data, but felt that that was overly broad, and often the answers are too variable. So we really wanted to target the groups that we were uh, going to be talking to, which were a fairly small community. Uh, so we decided to do um, interviews. And we um, sat down, each uh, two members from uh, the working group would sit down with the interviewees and, and we did targeted interviews to try and get really specific information that we wanted um, in that particular, in this particular area. So the people we interviewed, uh, you'll see here on the left, we, called, we end up calling them the exemplars, which are, um, a, a, some of them were identified uh, by the charge, but some of them we chose because they represented a nice cross-section of uh, digital preservation service providers we had vendors, we had academic institutions, profit, nonprofit, um, independent. Uh, so we had a, a nice uh, cross-section, we felt, of, of exemplars. And then, of course, we had the, all the UCs, the 11 groups. Um, the California Digital Library, CDL, um, is one of, we, we consider one of the UCs. We later sort of broke them out as a vendor because it was, seemed like they fit better with that, and you'll see that in the report, that they're the, the, with the vendors. Um, unfortunately, when we were reviewing or doing our interviewing process, um, the DPN was actually kind of starting to wind down. And so it was unfortunate to lose them as an exemplar, but we were able to interview them and actually hearing their story and, and their process was very informative for our group. So the group collaboratively designed a series of questions to pose to each of our interviewees and the question, their questionnaire was uh, covering 14 different topics that you see here, organization, mission, business model, succession, et cetera. Um, from those 14 topics, we developed about 80 questions. So these were fairly in-depth and detailed interviews. Um, the questions sought information about uh, systems, requirements, compliance, um, quality assurance, methods, best practices, um, reasoning around decisions that people made, policies, um, and uh, both roadblocks and successes and future plans. So the first interview was held in November 2018, and they continued until February 2019. So we had four months of that process, both of the external and internal interviews. Um, we held 22 targeted interviews. The interviews, um, again, were done by two, two members of the working group, uh, sitting one recording and one asking questions. We actually taped some of the interviews, which was really great. Um, 
And then, the, again, the UCs were sort of self-identified. I, I interviewed UC Berkeley as I'm a representative for UC Berkeley. Um, and then we had other teams who interviewed the other UCs. So the interviews ran between 60 to 80 minutes. So again, they were very detailed, um, very um, thorough. We used the same questionnaire for both. And then the questions were you know, resign, designed to be very detailed and specific, but also we left a lot of room for clarifying questions and flexibility in terms of going in different directions, but we tried to keep to a, to a questionnaire script. So this is pretty, and this is not meant for you to see, <laughs> because this is our working document, but one of my, um, my former um, employees who now works at UCSF created this color-coded uh, um, questionnaire, and these are the answers that were color-coded by interviewee, by topic, and what we did is we created one of these for every single of the, one of the interviewees, and then we used it to combine and um, analyze the data. And so actually, while it was very pretty, it was also very useful in terms of color coding, because you could jump from one interview to another and just and see by color quickly the answers and jump to where you wanted to be. Um, so they color, we color coded the 23 interviews into the sheets, um, and we did some further analysis to, to kind of distill the information down and um, we, you know, again, to observe uh, the gaps, um, overlaps, um, and other issues that um, we wanted to kind of uh, raise up in the interview responses. Um, and then we use these sheets to create um, what we call our matrices, which are the sort of the boiled down. And again, these are not things that I want you to see because these are in the report, so you can see these in the report, but this is really what we distilled those 80 questions and all of the 22 interviews into these simple um, exemplar matrices, or matrices. We did one for UC as well, I'll show you in a second. Um, so the response data is really simplified here, but again, it tells the story of what we were hearing across and trying to compare and analyze um, what we saw across the exemplars, and then we did the same for the UCs to sort of look at where the UCs were in terms of all this. The, um, again, CDL ended up in the other matrix, so we'll see them um, positioned there. So we identified through these matrices um, the trends, we observed the gaps, and then also confirmed some of our assumptions about where we are in terms of digital preservation as a community, and those are detailed in the report. Um, so we relied on, relied on the interview data to surface the key elements um, from our charge. You know, again, looking outward, looking inward, coming up with best, best practices, looking at gaps and overlap. And um, those are detailed in the final report, which is here, the pretty cover of that. You can see all the names. You'll see the names later. So the final report was drafted collaboratively online um, by the working group, and it provides an analysis and detailed representation of what we found in our matrices. Um, Edson's gonna be discussing the report in a little bit more detail, but it really provides a high level overview of current best practices for digital preservation, as well as outlining the key issues, building blocks, and lessons learned um, to be considered in developing a shared vision for digital preservation uh, in the libraries. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Edson. All right, thank you, Mary. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the University of California system, there are 10 campuses spread throughout the state. Um, five are in the north and five are in the south. And the one thing that we have in common is that we're linked by the San Andreas Fault. Um, so it, um, at last check, uh, UC had over 500,000 faculty, staff, and students. Um, so with so much distances between campuses and so many people involved, it's not surprising that individual campuses don't always know what the others are doing. So uh, based on our interviews, we found that UC campuses fell into three broad tiers of digital preservation activity. Um, there are two organizations at the top tier. The California Digital Library operates at the system-wide level and offers centralized services to all UC campuses. With regards to digital preservation, uh, CDL op um, offers a full suite of technical services to the UC campuses. Uh, the CDL preservation component is merit, which is a robust and geo-diverse, well-architected storage system, and it is core trust seal certified. Uh, the other top tier digital preservation program is Chronopolis, which is run out of UC San Diego. Uh, Chronopolis is a dark archive offering bit-level preservation. It's track certified, 
and partners with several large institutions, including national labs and statewide digital libraries. Uh, both of these considered to be, can be considered to be exemplars within the UC system. So at the other end of the spectrum are campuses that are consumers of services provided by the top tier. On the south, both the Riverside and Irvine campuses fall into this category, and in the north, the newest UC campus at Merced does it well. Uh, for a practical matter, these schools receive the bulk of their digital preservation services directly from CDL. They'll typically use CDL's DAM system, and as resources permit, will use CDL's merit for digital preservation. So um, what was really eye-opening for the committee, though, were the findings regarding what the schools in the middle tier were doing. And these are some of UC's largest campuses, including the flagship schools in Los Angeles and Berkeley. Um, in our interviews with ourselves, a number of common themes emerged for the middle tier campuses. Um, so uh, first of all, digital preservation is largely still aspirational. Um, no one's close to implementing practices that be, can be certified. And where preservation is practiced, there are large gaps between current practices and those of the exemplars that we interviewed. Um, also, no one is working together. Um, each of the middle tier campuses have pretty much decided to pursue digital preservation on their own. Uh, the campuses have been working in partnership with, have not been working in partnership with each other, although recently we started to see some collaborative efforts. Um, additionally, responsibilities for digital preservation are anything but uniform. Depending on where you are, the cognizant folks might be archivists, IT staff, uh, research data librarians, or born digital specialists. Um, additionally, there's lots of legacy systems that are going to need to be replaced before there can be standardized workflows. Uh, this is expensive and difficult work. Um, uh, and frequently, it's, uh, data migration is hard, and it's not always a priority. So where uh, efforts are in place, uh, we are seeing that staff and economic resources are very limited. Uh, digital preservation is almost always a side job for someone who has another role. And everyone's deeply concerned about the costs, especially for long-term preservation-grade storage. Uh, digital preservation, and I'm going to say this, is a forever project, and that means forever costs. Uh, so it's only natural this is going to meet resistance from those who are cost adverse. Uh, finally, at many campuses, um, the de facto preservation system is in fact a dams with a RAID storage array um, augmented by a tape backup or some cloud storage. Um, this is really an IT first approach and doesn't even come close to the recommended standards for replication, fixity, and geographic diversity. In short, this isn't digital preservation. So um, some additional findings in the area of technology. While there's still some unresolved technical problems in digital preservation to be addressed, for the UC system, our challenges aren't really in technology. Um, there's really nothing magical about uh, do, having a preservation repository. Um, all the salient issues have been understood and addressed for a generation. We have lots of tools to do the job, and we have reference architectures to build on. Uh, standards and policies are in place and are continuing to evolve as technology moves forward. Uh, data integrity at rest is no longer a significant problem. We used to worry about spontaneous corruption of data at rest, but in practice, once content makes it to bit-level storage, we're not seeing problems. Um, uh, something that was interesting we found is uh, that most of the storage being used for digital, digital preservation is local. Campuses are storing it on site. Uh, we're not sure why this is the case. Um, cloud storage is frequently less expensive and uh, potentially more robust. Um, we think that this could be inertia from a previous era. We are inherently conservative organizations. But in any case, the lack of geodiversity here is a gap and that needs to be addressed. And finally, the uh, cost of storage, ongoing annual storage costs for digital preservation are high. Uh, many folks see the list prices uh, for storage and they just throw their hands up in the air. Um, the good news is, though, that prices for cold storage in the cloud have gotten much more reasonable in the last few years, and this may change some uh, perceptions of cost. Um, some other findings. Uh, we have determined that the OAIS model is sound. Everyone we spoke to was comfortable with it. Uh, both the reference and the functional models. No one told us we were on the wrong path, and it's pretty clear to us that the community is getting this right. Um, similar, similarly, there's not a lot of debate on what constitutes best practices for digital preservation. Um, as far as certification goes, uh, there doesn't seem to be any doubt that uh, preservation reposity, repository needs to be certified. If it's worth building, it's definitely worth building to the community standard. Um, on the flip side, though, certification is very time consuming and by extension, very expensive. Oh, with regards to staff resources, uh, in many cases, staff sizes are small or composed of people who have other jobs. 
Outside of the two certified repositories, no one has digital preservation listed as their primary job. Uh, staff limitations are in turn hurdles to adopting and following best practices. Uh, many of the required skills to do digital preservation exist within the system, uh, but they're spread out among the campuses, and as I said before, we're not really collaborating. Um, finally, prioritization. Many campuses, frankly, aren't interested in building their own preservation system, and that's okay. Um, they're expensive, and the ROI is really difficult to quantify. Uh, instead, we're seeing resources being directed to dams development. So um, our working group was supposed to do a survey and identify gaps and not come to any conclusions, uh, but um, we couldn't help but come to some. Uh, the, so for us, the bottom line here is technology should not be our focus. Uh, the gaps we need to address are in procedures, policies, and workflows. Also, system-wide resources are limited and they are not coordinated. And uh, we agree it's fair to say that UC's best path is not going to lie with 11 separate uh, certified repositories. Um, our challenge instead is to develop a well-articulated governance model for system-wide digital preservation services. And my final point here is the path to success at the UC level is not to centralize, but rather to collaborate. Okay. And uh, Todd will wrap it all up for us. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to just uh, uh, offer um, a little bit of thought on, the, on phase one and uh, give you an overview on what we're doing in phase two. Um, now, when, when we think about digital preservation, this is the collective we, um, we think about it in terms of um, technology, personnel, and policy. And to do digital preservation well, you need all three of those things to run together. Um, you know, one thing that was interesting um, is that we found um, nine of the ten campuses, and to some degree, um, using um, the merit system from CDL, um, which is a trusted digital repository, and it has all three of those elements. Uh, that was pretty good news. Um, I think the, the, <clears throat> the challenge with the system is that, you know, as Edson and, and Mary pointed out, um, there's not a lot of coordination often are talking about, um, you know, when we talk about uh, digital preservation, sometimes uh, in, <clears throat> in DOC, um, we approach these, the, the same problem thinking about it in different ways because it is a very um, complement, uh, I'm sorry, complex and complicated thing that we've, um, we're just sort of scratching the surface. Um, and I think, you know, uh, without staff, job it is to do digital preservation. It's also one of those things where it's really hard to get your hands on exactly what's going on and who's doing what in the system because, you know, people are, but maybe we don't know who to ask. It's just, it's a hard thing. Um, so phase two is, um, you know, here's there are the, um, um, the meat and potatoes of the charge. You know, it's a way for us to start talking collaboratively about what's What's in the system? What needs to be taken care of? What, uh, <clears throat> what sort of workflows do we need in order to develop uh, preservation programs that are scalable and across the system? Um, and also uh, provide um, services, resources, activities uh, for um, uh, people within the system um, who want to learn about digital preservation to get some training on that activity. Um, it's it's important that if we want to have a workforce that's trained for these future activities, that we need to provide them with those services. And so that's, that's really part of what we're doing. Um, and uh, let's see. So we wanted to just recognize what an excellent working group we had, um, patting ourselves on the back. It was really um, a very good group. We did a lot of work very quickly. I thought it was really high quality work. Um, the phase one report is linked here. Um, it's actually a, for a kind of a technical report, it's a pretty good read. So if you're interested, uh, it's not a bad place to start. Um, and we will be producing other phases of um, uh, this work and producing the re uh, further reports as well. Uh, with, with that, I think we'll take some questions. <clears throat>